This PA-60 was just starting its approach to Philadelphia International Airport. On board, there was only one passenger with two flight crew. The passenger was a United States Senator by the name of Henry John Hines, who also happened to be the heir to the Hines family fortune. After the flight crew received an indication that the gear was not locked down, a local helicopter offered to inspect the gear for them. What followed was a series of events that turned into pure chaos and then tragedy. You're not going to want to miss this truly unbelievable incident, so stay tuned. On the 4th of April 1991, this Piper PA-60 was scheduled for an air taxi flight from Williamsport Lycoming County Airport to Philadelphia International Airport, both in Pennsylvania. The passenger, United States Senator Henry John Hines, was in Williamsport for a press conference pertaining to federal funding of US Route 15, which was a crucial link between Williamsport and the state capital of Harrisburg. Because there was a US Senator on board, it was required that the aircraft was to operate with two flight crew. For the crew on board, the captain had a total of 1,547 hours on single-engine aircraft and 428 hours on multi-engine aircraft. This was only his second revenue flight as a captain of the PA-60. His first trip was three days before, on the 1st of April 1991. He was operating as a single pilot during this flight, with the passenger being a senior executive for the company that manufactured the engines for the PA-60. Ironically, during the flight, just after reaching cruising altitude, they suffered a surging engine and had to return to the airfield. The passenger did note that the captain had some problems starting the engines and had to instruct him on the proper starting techniques. The first officer had a total of 1,351 hours in single-engine aircraft with 194 hours in multi-engine aircraft. He had flown the nights before, with his duty time being from 2100 on the 3rd of April until 0600 on the day of the incident. He reportedly slept from 0630 until 0900, and even with this reduced sleep, he was not outside his flight or duty time for this flight under the limitations at the time. But it was safe to say he was probably a little sleep deprived. The time was now 0950, and with the Senator on board, the crew gained clearance and started the engines. They taxied the aircraft to the taxi holding point, and very soon they were cleared for takeoff. At 10.22 Eastern Standard Time, they took off and began their journey to Philadelphia International. The climb out and cruise all occurred uneventfully, with the en route phase of the flight lasting approximately one hour. As the PA-60 drew closer to Philadelphia, they were informed of the current weather at the airfield, and to expect the Instrument Landing System, or ILS, approach to runway 17. The weather at Philadelphia was nice, the wind was coming from 250 degrees at 8 knots, the clouds were scattered at 25,000 feet, visibility was more than 10 miles, and the temperature was 59 degrees Fahrenheit, which was a cool 15 degrees Celsius. They were then cleared for the approach and descent. Whilst in the descent, a Bell 412 helicopter, operated by Sun Company Aviation Department, was just starting up on the company's helicopter landing pad at Philadelphia International Airport. This flight was scheduled for a short hop across to the Sun Company corporate headquarters in Radnor, Pennsylvania. The captain and first officer were the only two persons on board. For this flight crew, the captain had a total of 8,000 flying hours, of which 2,380 were in Sun Company helicopters. The first officer had also accumulated around 8,000 flying hours of which 1,629 of those hours were in Sun Company helicopters. It was also noted on his application for employment to the Sun Company that he had some experience flying the Piper Aerostar. The crew were given clearance to depart and at 11.50 the Bell 412 took off and began heading towards Radnor. At 12.01 the PA-60 started its approach. As the captain selected the gear down he noticed that the gear indicators were showing that the nose gear was not down and locked. He then reported to air traffic control that they were having issues and he would need to recycle the landing gear. This was acknowledged by the tower and they further instructed him to maintain 1,500 feet 
to allow the Bell 412 to pass underneath. The crew of the Bell 412 heard that the PA-60 were having issues with the gear, and at 12.02 they passed underneath the PA-60. They kept a lookout to see if the gear was down, and then they reported to the tower by saying, the Aerostar that went past us looks like the gear is down. The captain of the PA-60 then confirmed to air traffic control that they had heard the Bell 412 transmission, but stated, I can tell it's down, but I don't know if it's locked, that's the problem. The captain could see the reflection of the gear in the propeller spinner from the cockpit. Air traffic control then informed the PA-60 that the helicopter was no longer a factor and cleared them to land on runway 17. The tower supervisor then alerted the airport's aircraft rescue and firefighting units to be ready for the aircraft's arrival. All runway 17 arrivals were terminated to allow the P-60 the free air to deal with the emergency and to ensure clear communication between the tower and the PA-60. The controller got in touch with the PA-60 again and offered the option to carry out a low altitude pass off the control tower so that the tower personnel could observe the position of the landing gear. They further explained that there was almost no traffic right now, we can do whatever you like. The captain of the PA-60 accepted the option and turned towards the tower. He brought back the speed and lined the aircraft up with the left side of the tower. As he passed by the tower, he turned slightly to the left to allow for the tower personnel to get a better view of the gear. After he had completed his pass, the tower got in touch and advised the captain that the nose gear appeared down. The captain repeated that he was able to see his nose gear from the reflection of the propeller spinner and that it appeared to be down, but the indicator light was not green. With no other options to attempt, the controller requested that the PA-60 make a left turn and enter the downwind leg for a visual circuit to runway 17. As they were making the turn downwind, the crew of the Bell 412 made contact with the controller, informing them that they were heading back to the field from the north. They checked if the PA-60 was still having issues with the gear and offered to carry out an inspection if they needed it. It was Sun Company policy at the time to be good neighbours. Sun Company officials had offered the services of their aircraft and flight crews to assist the local community in the event of emergency situations. Their aircraft had on previous occasions been used to assist the tower in locating vehicles or people on and around the airport. It was this attitude and culture that encouraged the pilots of the Bell 412 to assist where they could. That being said, the chief pilots for the Sun Company stated that he was not aware of any previous in-flight inspections of other aircraft by any of the pilots within the company, so this was going to be a first for the crew of the Bell 412. The controller then informed the captain of the PA-60 that the crew of the Bell 412 had offered to take a look at the nose gear. The captain stated, OK, I appreciate it. At this point, the airport's aircraft rescue and firefighting units were ready on the runway to assist the PA-60. With the time now 12.05, the PA-60 was extending downwind to maintain their current heading. The controller was providing directional information to the flight crew of the Bell 412 to allow them to locate the PA-60. The Piper Aerostar reduced its speed to 125 knots to allow for the helicopter to catch up with it. It was continuing to fly downwind at an altitude of 1,100 feet. The Bell 412 turned left over the airfield to line up with and intercept the PA-60. The controller now informed the crew of the PA-60 that there were antenna towers 6 miles ahead of them and requested that they notify the tower when they wanted to return to the airport or make a heading change. At 12.07, the Bell 412 was on the correct heading and closing the gap to the Piper aircraft. They could see the fixed-wing aircraft as a small dot just above the horizon. The Bell 412 requested that the PA-60 reduce its speed further to allow them to reduce the distance. Using the tower frequency to communicate with each other, the crew of the Bell 412 stated, We're going to come up behind you on your left side, so just hold your heading. Both aircraft were now visual with each other, although it was difficult for the PA-60 to remain visual with the helicopter as they were behind and below them. The captain of the PA-60 now stated that the antenna towers were straight ahead of them and that they might need to change their heading by 15 degrees to the left. By this time the Bell 412 was started to move closer to the PA-60 and hearing that they may need to turn left, they then stated, 
Aerostar, we're going to pass around your right side now, take a look at everything as we go by. The captain of the PA-60 responded with, OK. And at 12.10, the Bell 412 began to come to the right side of the PA-60. They moved in closer to get a better look at the nose gear. Both the aircraft, still at 1,100 feet and around 125 knots, were gathering the attention of the local town as they looked up to see what was happening. The first officer of the Bell 412 then stated, Everything looks good from here. The captain of the PA-60 then replied, OK, appreciate that. We'll start to turn in. As the aircraft began to depart from each other, unexpectedly, the blades from the Bell 412 struck the underside of the PA-60. Both aircraft started to spin out of control. Both crews frantically attempted to regain control of their aircraft, but both aircraft had sustained damage, rendering them uncontrollable. The local people watched in horror as both aircraft tumbled towards the ground. The controller, unaware of what was happening, requested the PA-60 make a left turn back to the airport and cleared them to land on runway 17. But nothing was heard back. The controller then noticed a smoke plume to the north of the airport. They made several attempts to contact either of the aircraft, but they were unsuccessful. At 12.10, both aircraft crashed into the ground killing both crews and the senator passenger. This event becomes even more tragic as the aircraft were traveling over a populated area and as they crashed, they hit the ground around an elementary school. This caused the deaths of two children and a further five people were injured. After the investigation into this incident was concluded by the National Transportation Safety Board, it was determined that the probable cause was the poor judgment by the captain of the airplane to permit the in-flight inspection after he had determined to the best of his ability that the nose landing gear was fully extended. The poor judgment of the captain of the helicopter to conduct the inspection and the failure of the flight crew of the helicopter to maintain safe separation. The exact cause of the collision could not be determined with many eyewitness accounts differing. There was a general agreement that before the collision, the helicopter was below and to the right of the airplane. Some witnesses reported that the airplane veered to the right and struck the helicopter, whereas others reported that the helicopter climbed and hit the plane. One of the witnesses, who was on a roof of a house nearby, stated that the wind began to gust shortly before the aircraft collided. It was also discovered that none of the flight's crew from either aircraft had experienced flying close formation with two of the potential hazards that could have led to this incident being turbulence-induced blade stall and settling experienced by rotary wing aircraft when flying in the turbulence area behind and below a fixed wing aircraft, and the opposing pitch changes experienced by both aircraft when one aircraft flies closely behind and below the other. One of the phenomena caused by this turbulence air is that the aircraft behind and below can experience a nose-up pitching moment and the higher aircraft can experience a nose down pitching moment. I have flown in close formation before with two other aircraft. When we flew in what is called line astern, this is where you fly in a line of aircraft with the aircraft being stepped down from each other, you can find a sweet spot where the turbulence effects and the prop wash of the aircraft ahead and above are minimal. But as soon as you drift slightly left or right, you can physically feel the turbulent air hitting the aircraft. Being in this position without having the experience to anticipate the effects of the aircraft must have made holding adequate separation very difficult. It was discovered that in the FAA approved flight manual for the Piper PA-60, it does not contain emergency landing gear extension procedures in the emergency procedures section. However, the section containing information on hydraulic pump failure provides information on lowering the gear. As they didn't have a cockpit voice recorder for the PA-60, it could not be determined if the captain took any action to isolate the problem to the indicator light or verify the nose gear was locked in the down position. Because of this incident, many safety recommendations were issued. To the Federal Aviation Administration, it was to include in the Airman's Information Manual Advisories on the potential dangers of flying aircraft in close proximity to another one, highlighting the aerodynamic interactions that can be encountered. It was further required that the flight manual for the Piper Aerostar PA-60, so that the emergency procedures section, includes information on the actions to be taken 
in the event of an unsafe landing gear indication. They were to more aggressively disseminate and promote materials pertaining to aeronautical decision making training and to advise members of multiple aircraft associations of this incident and the potential dangers associated with performing in-flight inspections of other aircraft or close proximity manoeuvres. This tragic incident highlighted the need for critical decision making whilst in the air. Yes, in-flight inspections can happen and assistance from other aircraft can be a positive, but the risk must be weighed up. In this incident, there was nothing more they could do to check if the landing gear was locked. The captain could see the gear was down through the reflection of the prop spinner and at that point nothing more could be done to confirm it any further. The inspection by the tower and the Bell 412 only confirmed what the captain already knew. A landing with an unconfirmed nose wheel would have been the best option. There are many examples of successful landings with an unsafe nose wheel. It's not the perfect situation but the next reasonable step once all actions have been carried out to ensure the gear is locked. The tragedy was further compounded with the inspection taking place over a residential area and could have reduced the loss of life if it had been carried out over a more remote area. I would love to hear what you have to think about this incident. It's not the most uplifting story, but something unusual and interesting that should be learned from. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I hope you are having a great day. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.